Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, right off the bat, I'd like to let everybody know that uh, Sister Renee will not be joining us, us tonight. And it's not because she doesn't want to. She even told me she would like to participate from the hospital room that she's in, currently in. She's had to go back in the hospital because of a, a, an infection. She had a small uh, cut that nor would, normally it would not be a big issue, but because of uh, all the other health issues and the new medicine she's on, uh, it seems that her um, little cut, uh, the infection got really bad in 24 hours. And um, she says it's even can turn into gangrene and so she's going to have emergency surgery done tonight to remove a little portion of the uh, arm that is uh, infected. It's probably just a small piece, maybe size of a dime or something, uh, if it less it's grown more. But uh, it is serious because uh, that infection, if it spreads, she can't get MRSA because uh, her history is uh, uh, that she's gone through it. it, it a lot of people can overcome problems like that. But with if she gets mercy, it's really, really bad. So uh, that's why she's not with us. Uh, she said she'd join us from the hospital room if she could, but I said, don't even try it. I didn't even send her the link to join us because I just wanted to get rest. But uh, I'm gonna just ask everybody, just pray for her right now and, and also just keep her in your prayers. And But I, uh, I do have Brother Cripps uh, with me uh, as usual. And uh, I contact Brother Stephen. He was willing to uh, join us tonight uh, in uh, in place of uh, Renee. So uh, let me ask uh, Brother Cripps, why don't you say hi to everybody? And then then Brother Steve, too. Hey, everybody. Jason Cripps here. Um, just glad to be here. Another Bible study. These are all, they've enriched my life. I'm so glad to be a part of it, as I've said before. But I'll say that every episode, just to make sure. Um, the older I get and the more I realize how important it is to have people that you can trust around you, people you consider um, not just brothers and sisters in Christ, but also friends. And I can say that uh, certainly about Steve and Brother Luke, that I do consider them a friend. I consider them people that if I needed to ever uh, talk to someone in confidence, I believe that they would, uh, would uh, listen to me and I don't have to worry about being stabbed in the back or in the front, so that's good. And uh, I'll just say real quick hello to everyone in, that's already here in the chat room. Um, and uh, gosh, can't wait to get started. Thanks a lot, Brother Luke. Okay, thank you. Brother Steve, tell everybody who you are in case there's someone out there who hasn't met you yet. Hello, I'm Brother Steve. Um, my channel name is Soldier for Christ. We are at war. Um, I'm also looking for, uh, some possible better, shorter, easier to look up and remember channel names. Uh, but basically, uh, my channel is about spiritual warfare, um, and the gospel. Uh, those are the two things I... Uh, contend for the gospel and secondarily spiritual warfare and how it pertains to that. Um, so, uh, yep, my name's Steve. Great to be here. Thanks uh, for having me again, Brother Luke. It's always a pleasure uh, to be on the panel with you on your uh, channel and uh, uh, always a pleasure to be on the panel uh, with Jason as well. Amen. Um... Yeah, if you have not subscribed already, uh, please subscribe to uh, Brother Cripp's channel, True Story Live. And Brother Steve's channel is uh, uh, Soldier for Christ. That's with the number four. Soldier for Christ. We are at war. Yeah, I'm surprised you haven't come up with a, a short uh, name uh, that's appropriate for your, your mission. Uh, if anybody has any ideas for Steve, uh, for a new name for his channel, it's short, memorable, and descriptive of uh, spiritual warfare, uh, you know, let us know. We're looking for ideas for his channel. 
All right. <laughs> uh, Steve, are you looking for a shorter name for your channel? Is that, is that right? <laughs> yes. I, oh, okay. I think I was given good advice on that. Okay. Uh, to make it shorter. Um, so it's more easily accessible. You even had uh, trouble finding me a I did. while back. So I, I did. I just um, didn't know that you decided to do that yet. So I'll definitely. I, I, I want to do it, but I'm looking for something that. Uh, here, here's what I'm looking for. Uh, I'm looking for something that encompasses what I'm doing as far as spiritual warfare. Uh -huh. It's not cliche. Okay. Like, you know, uh, and uh, something that uh, is not already being used. Okay. Uh, so that's a, that's a tough, that's a tough thing to to do um, with uh, what I'm after, you know, and so something that's catchy, but yet not cliche. Something that has will encompass what I'm doing, but um, well, you know, it isn't already being used. Okay, challenge accepted. All right. I'm on it. I'm on it, Awesome. Steve. I have a few suggestions so far, uh, but nothing has quite just struck the bell yet. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Brother Hendricks just uh, posted another suggestion for you. Uh, he says it should be Soldier for Christ, We Are at War, O-S-A-S, -S, Jesus Only, and I Also Like Ponies. <laughs> Do you like ponies, <laughs> Steve? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a there was a brother that worked with me a few years ago, and and uh, we haven't that, spoken. That, that's that's really long. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like yeah we're trying to long. everybody. We're trying we're to get a score. For... You can remember name for him, not that. Yeah, we're we're looking for two words, at most three words. Yeah. For the channel name. So, like, you know, uh, Brother Luke, you got Sin City Preacher. Then you got Jason, True Story Live. You got Matthias, Talking Doctrine. You know, um, you got Renee, Renee Roland. Um, you got, uh, you know, several channel names there. And all of them are quick, easy, and tell what you're about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. So yeah, well, uh, uh, that's what about, we're looking uh, for. How about Demon Fighter? That that's that 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 might work. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Something like that. You know. Yeah. Um, but uh, that almost sounds like the band name I know. That's a Christian yeah. metal band, uh, Demon Hunter. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right, we're going to uh, get into the Bible study now in Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 1. But first, before we do, I'd like to acknowledge the, the chat room. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, I'm seeing uh, uh, Stacy Cook and Celine and uh, uh, Hendrix. Uh, it looks like there's a channel named Renee, but it's not actually Sister Renee that where we've referred to Renee Rowland, but, uh, and then, uh, let me see. Well, to all those in the chat room, welcome. If, if you're new to our program, uh, uh, welcome. Uh, I hope that uh, you find this profitable and, and uh, decide to participate all the time. Uh, we, I have the Wednesday night Bible study, uh, a Sunday church service, uh, that's 5 p.m. Eastern time, and every Friday night, I interview uh, the members of the congregation. We've done about 15 interviews, I think, so far, and we've got probably another 100 or 200 more to go. <laughs> so if you're a re regular participant in this congregation, then uh, I definitely would like to interview you. And the point of that is just, I think it's a good idea for us to get to know each other better. And that's that I, I'm trying to accomplish through these interviews. All right, now, if you didn't see uh, last week, in fact, if you have not seen all of the Bible studies that we've done on the book of Romans, uh, we've completed the first seven chapters. Please go back and watch this all from the beginning, uh, especially the first couple of uh, studies on Romans because they're laying the foundation and uh, 
uh, introducing an idea called prosopopoeia. These are a couple of things that uh, I think would be very, very important for you to have that at least in mind as, as we continue on. Uh, last week, we actually did an entire chapter. Usually we only get through maybe five or 10 or 15 verses, but we got through the entire chapter. We went on, on longer than normal because we were close to the end and didn't want to leave it, leave it like a cliffhanger. Uh, the end of chapter seven is so exciting. So um, now beginning chapter eight, uh, let me, I'll read it and then ask for your thoughts on it, brothers. Uh, okay. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And there's a period there. Ha! A period! Wow. Yeah, we've, we've talked a lot about how Paul has a lot of question marks in his, in his uh, scriptures. So, but finally, we get just a statement. Uh, so let me ask Brother Kretz uh, first. Or give me your thoughts on verse 1. I'd be delighted. This is the scripture that I wish people would remember every time someone accuses them of uh of uh, anything that they're doing in their life and uh trying to make them focus on their sin in some way and they know that they're saved by what christ did on the cross for them there there is and and by the way i'll jump ahead and say that the period is telling the period is telling the way that paul uses the question mark and all the other things that end his sentences. And Brother Luke, you've brought it up every time it arises. And for good reason. There's a reason why Paul ends his uh, verses the way he does. And I would even say that it would be appropriate to have it in capital letters, P-E-R-I-O-D, period. Um, the other thing I'm going to say, there's, there's therefore no condemnation that could be in capital letters right there no condemnation to them which are in christ jesus that walk in him that have the newness of life that we've discussed over the past several weeks and here's the point where i have continually talked about how this is a choice this part right here who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit this is something that we choose to do every day we we decide to walk in the newness of life the spirit that he's given us rather than this flesh suit that we carry around with us. We keep referring back to it because it's so important to understand. Um, uh, and this verse, I just absolutely love it. And I look at it all the time, especially when um, I get accused of uh, anything where someone's trying to condemn me for greasy grace or uh, as brother Lucas brought up several times is how much when we're uh, preaching this, this type of gospel, which is absolutely um, Christ alone with nothing added. Um, I look at this verse and I am confident that there is indeed no condemnation to me because I do walk in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And, and Brother Steve, what do you say? Great verse, great verse. I finally got my laptop working. <laughs> so I'm looking at that here in a second. Uh, I love that verse. It's, it's also important, I think, to remember where Paul is coming from with this verse. Um, from, from like the last few uh, verses in chapter 7 where Paul is saying, you know, uh, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's who's given him the victory over this body of death so that therefore there is now no condemnation. Why? Because in verse 25, so then with my mind I serve 
the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So, you know, the flesh uh, will continue to sin until the day we die. But with our mind, we have the ability to serve the law of God, the, the law of faith. We have the ability to serve that. And because there's now this distinction between the flesh is over there sinning and and it's going to continue to sin until it dies. That's why it must be destroyed. And now, because we are in Christ, there is no more condemnation because now I serve God with my mind and with my spirit, the spirit which has been regenerated and perfected forever. That's why there's no now no more condemnation to them who are in, who are in Christ Jesus because although we live in the flesh and our flesh continues as flesh, but our, our, our is no longer walking after the flesh because it is no longer dead, but it is alive in Christ and perfect. And it's with our mind that we either choose to walk with God or walk uh, with the flesh. But that, will there that Paul shows us showed us in verse seven in chapter seven that sometimes he struggles with which voice to listen to like you guys mentioned last week being somewhat schizophrenic you know sometimes um and uh so it's it's this this verse chapter eight verse one is like the the culmination of the victory and the promise that we have in Christ that although we still war after the flesh, we are not under condemnation by the flesh because we, we walk in faith and we've been born again by faith and we live to glorify God. And that's how we should walk as believers. But even if we fall into sin, that's our flesh sinning. It's no longer me that's sinning, but it's the flesh. When I choose to do the will of God, that is Christ in me choosing to do the will of God. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Amen. Uh, let me... Um, I, I take the opportunity quite often to um, um, lay down some principles for Bible study and that we have to always keep in mind as we're, as we're studying the scriptures, we've got to know that there are some things that we've got to always uh, have as a, as we're reading it to, to, so that, so that we don't uh, misplace a verse put it with, make the verse think the verse is talking about someone or something that's not really it's about it and one of the principles is is context uh, one of them is the clarity uh or versus ambigu ambiguity um uh, but another thing that is uh, not talked about that often is um we've we've talked about punctuation how paul and it, particularly in paul's case punctuation is uh really significant there's a lot of questions and why he does it what that why that is his style it's not just accidental and his questions are there for for a reason uh but uh, some people think that um now you know when the when the originals were pinned uh there were no chapter designations and no verse locations so we, we, now we have chapter and verse, and the reason we have chapter and verse is for our convenience to easily locate a verse. But uh, they were not originally written with chapter and verse, so chapter and verse should not be actually considered scripture, really, because it wasn't originally included. But uh, there are a lot of people that don't realize that just because a chapter ends and another chapter begins doesn't mean that now, oh, now we're on to a new subject. <laughs> no, that's why what Brother Steve did, going back to the previous uh, chapter, the end of it, and connecting it uh, is, is important to understand because this is not now Paul's off onto a different subject. And In fact, it, Paul uses the word therefore uh, often. 
I've never compared other uh, other uh, b- books of the Bible to see how often therefore appears, but I suspect that the word therefore appears in the Pauline epistles at a much a greater rate or frequency than, than elsewhere in the Bible. Because Paul it has a style of building a case and then making a conclusion, and then building a case and making a conclusion. And when this verse starts off, there is therefore, see, he's, he's, he's making a conclusion, and the conclusion is drawn based upon the last chapter, all the points that were made in the last chapter. So if you didn't study the last chapter, you're not going to appreciate his conclusion nearly as much as, as we did, because we've studied it. Uh, but the, the, to me, the important thing is uh, that um, this is really what Paul and, and uh, hopefully, uh, and, and I think I'm sure that Jesus would like for us to comprehend and get into our thick skulls, the point in this very verse here. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And I'm, I'm sorry to, to say this, but in, in all my observations in, for 32 years now, uh, talking to professing Christians, um, a large part of professing Christians have not gotten rid of their condemnation. <laughs> and that's, uh, that, that tells me one of two things. Either they didn't really understand the gospel in the beginning, because this is the gospel. It's the good news that you're not condemned. There's no more condemnation on you. You're you're complete. You're considered by God innocent and perfect. No sins on you, and you have complete perfect righteousness because Jesus paid for your sins, and because His righteousness is credited to you. And that is the gospel, and that's the understanding that we need to conclude in order for us to even uh, be a Christian. If we don't understand and believe that premise, uh, we are not even a Christian. Uh, And yet, brothers, how often do you encounter believers who are are walking around all the time, not realizing, not, not, or, or forgetting? Maybe they didn't understand it in in the first place. And if they didn't understand it in the first place, we have a serious problem because they didn't even understand the gospel. But sometimes I, I believe people can understand it. And then because of problems in their life and stresses and, and, and things and, and maybe false teachers entering in, and particularly if they're a babe in Christ and, and don't know the scriptures that well, and they get led astray by false teachers and get confused and fall into apostasy. And then, they, and then of course, they can walk around with condemnation because they don't realize that, hey, condemnation is, doesn't apply to a Christian. So uh, let me read it in the Amplified. Uh, For those of you who are not familiar with me and my channel, uh, I'm a KJV firstist. For 25 years, I was KJV only, and I still use the KJV as my scripture, as the test against all other translations. Uh, But I like to look at the Amplified particularly because it amplifies it. And that's all Brother Steve and Brother Cripps and I are doing tonight is we're reading the, the KJV and then amplifying it uh, in our own words, trying to explain uh, you know, what, how, what we think it really means. And so the Amplified Bible gives us uh, an amplification uh, for, to help us understand the, the deeper meaning of it. And it says, therefore, there is now no condemnation, that is no guilty verdict, no punishment for those who are in Christ Jesus, that is, those who believe in him as personal Lord and Savior. Um, I would like to talk about that term, uh, Lord and Savior, but first let's, let me ask Brother Cripps, uh, what's your thoughts on that, the way that's stated there? Let me post it here in our private chat, just so you can, if you don't have uh, access to the Amplified, I'll put it right here. Are you there, Brother Cripps? Oh, yeah, 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 I'm here. I'm tracking with you. Okay, so I posted it, that verse there in the Amplified, just so you can look at it if you want. But the way the Amplified states it, give me your thoughts on that, will you? Yeah, they they, they drag this out a little bit more. So, yeah, they're really uh, living up to the name Amplified for sure. So they make the point, no guilty verdict, no punishment 
is is entered in there. Um, uh, now, a lot of people, as we read King James, uh, not only, but as you say, Brother Luke, preferred, or first, King James uh, first, um, uh, we understand the meaning of condemnation, but maybe, uh, maybe not everyone does. So they lay it out for us. No guilty verdict, no punishment. Um, that's important to understand because, again, uh, Christ took all of our punishment on himself um, on the cross. That's every type of punishment whatsoever. Now, that doesn't mean that when we make poor decisions in this realm that we won't have some kind of consequences, just the natural consequences of, uh, I mean, if you if you rob a liquor store and, and you get caught, there's going to be some consequences. So that's a different kind of punishment you know, that you would suffer for that. But no eternal punishment for those. Uh, it amplifies that pretty well. Um, it re reiterates uh, how we uh, access that uh, for those that are in Christ Jesus. So that said, that's the similar thing. It's the same there. Who believe in him as their personal Lord and Savior. And I'll kick it over to you, Brother Luke, to explain uh, what you want to explain about personal Lord and Savior, unless uh, Steve had a comment. But um, I think they do a really good job. The thing I like the most about it is them adding the words, no guilty verdict, no punishment. That's awfully helpful, in my opinion. I'm ready. Yeah, go ahead, Brother Steve. All right. <laughs> um, see, uh, what, what, what is interesting about that statement is it completely separates and what's great about this verse in the Amplified is it like, especially the latter half, is it destroys the 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 workers uh, for salvation. Those that think that in verse one, it's talking about those who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit are those who, you know, those that strive somehow to attain th th their salvation, which can't be because uh, it, then Paul would contradict himself with the sin saying it's not by works, which we have uh, works of righteousness. It's not, it's not by works because we're not allowed to have anything to boast in our salvation. It's only to boast in Christ. So what does that mean exactly? And I think the Amplified really does it well um and uh uh another thing that's interesting is that that part those who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit isn't in all of the earlier manuscripts uh the original manuscripts but that's a side note um but it's there but the way the amplified translates it um i think gives a more a, a better understanding of the text in that the separation is in, is in believers and unbelievers because Christ is Lord and King. Christ is savior, whether you believe in him or not, what makes him your personal savior is your choosing to trust in him as Lord and savior for you for you to receive that salvation from him to you through the vehicle of faith, you know? Um, so that's what makes Christ your personal Lord and savior, but he is Lord and savior period. He is God and King. He is, he is the alpha and the, and the Omega. He is the one that uh, was alive and 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 was dead and liveth forevermore. I mean, he's all those things, but what makes him personal is when you have a relationship with him that comes and starts at the point of belief that that comes to that place of full trust in him at, at least once to where you, you completely trusted him alone for your salvation that you are relying on no one and nothing else that nothing you can do or anyone else could do but christ alone you trust him for your salvation that's what makes him personal lord and savior and that's what separates those that walk after the spirit those who believed in christ as as personal lord and savior who have trusted him in him completely no one else, not even themselves, 
And that's where they're not walking after the flesh. They're not trusting in their flesh. They're trusting in Christ alone. That's what makes him your personal Lord and Savior, because you've entered into a personal relationship with Christ. Personal relationship. Amen. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> yes. Um, there are, are certain phrases that, that you hear often in um, among Christians uh, that um, I just, you, you said you don't want a cliche for your, your uh, channel name. Well, a cliche is not always a bad thing. A cliche, it becomes a cliche is because someone embraces a term and repeat it enough that, that it, uh, it becomes known as a cliche something that's just so commonly well known. Um, but uh, some of the things that we say, uh, uh, you know, you have to analyze it and say, like when someone says, well, I asked Jesus to come into my heart, you know, that's a, that's a kind of a cliche, but that's not the correct way to understand salvation and uh, the gospel and uh, Christianity. Uh, and so this personal Lord and Savior is also a cliche. Uh, but uh, I believe it's a good, good cliche as long as a person understands what the word Lord means. Because uh, often when people say Jesus is my Lord and Savior, I mean, I should be celebrating when anybody tells me Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I mean, I, I should be able to just say, wow, brother, you know, but I have to actually wonder, what, what do you mean by Lord? <laughs> Isn't that horrible? Because uh, there are many people, as a matter of fact, we, we even have a term for this doctrine. It's called lordship salvation. And that is the, the teaching, the false teaching, that in order to gain salvation, uh, we have to have Jesus be Lord of our lives. In other words, all control of our life is given to Jesus. And not only do we surrender control over to him, but we must also let him and successfully uh, have uh, have him uh, control all of our thoughts, words, and deeds for the rest of our life. And, and, and that's a, a wonderful thing to do. I'm not against that. That's what I want to do. But when people teach that this is the means of gaining salvation, then it's a, then it's a false teaching because we know that the Bible says salvation is received as a free gift. It's not an exchange where you get you get salvation as long as you're willing to give over your life control and follow Jesus and serve him and get sin out of your life. That's the that's the false doctrine of salvation by works. Uh, so when people say Jesus is my Lord and Savior, unfortunately, it's kind of a red flags and little alarms are going off in my head. I need to know what they mean by Lord and Savior. Now, when we see Lord in the Pauline epistles, um, it's the, the translators don't always, uh, they're not inerrant, but uh, uh, they do try to use capitalization to tell us that it's referring to uh, about Jesus or about uh, when it says he and it's capitalized, you know, it's referring to he is, is referring to God. That's how the translators use capitalization. But when it comes to the word Lord, if we see Lord, when Sarah says that, uh, Abraham is is her Lord. Uh, Abraham was her husband, and she referred to him as Lord. Uh, she meant that he's the boss, he's in charge. He, she's he, he's uh, he he has a control in the household, and and she's there to serve him. He, she to be his helpmate. The uh, scriptures use that term, helpmate. But that then in that case, the word Lord would be lowercase. When we see Lord and it's in capital capitalized, or it's safe to say whenever Paul used the word Lord, he's not talking about Lord in terms of, well, you have a superior position over the other person. Uh, he, he's saying Lord as in kurios, K-U-R-I-O-S, Greek word, which means God, deity. So if a person says, Jesus is my Lord God and Savior, if they were using Lord, 
uh, with the understanding that, that they're saying Jesus is my God and Savior. I, I like to express it. Jesus is my Savior God. Well, Savior, and he has to be God because the Bible says only God can be the Savior. <laughs> so uh, Jesus is my Savior God. Uh, I, and I don't mind saying Jesus is my Lord and Savior, but unfortunately, it's it's like baptized and repent and many other words in the Bible now that uh, unfortunately uh, they don't mean the same thing to everybody. Let me get at your feedback on that first, Brother Cripps. I'm sorry, I was having a little bit. <laughs> you know, we've gone like several broadcasts without there being any uh, issues with on, on my end. Um, the last part cut out for me, so I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure which part you want feedback on. I do apologize. Well, let me ask Steve if he was listening to comment, and uh, and but I'm asking you to. Did you hear the part where I was uh, distinguishing the uh, the word Lord, making the point about Lord that I was making? Uh, Steve, give me your thoughts on that, and then we'll let uh, Brother Cripps go after you. I did. No problem. Okay. Um, uh, the, the word Lord, I, I, I heard most of it. I remember you, you said, uh, Sarah called Abraham Lord. Um, but I wasn't sure exactly what your point was. I was, uh, I was following the chat well, let me, there. So, okay. So you guys are, you guys are not listening cause you're in the chat room. <laughs> it's, it's not because my connection, the audio is not working right. It's just, you're not listening. Is that the case? I'm All right. sure let Jason me, me was listening. I, 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 actually, I actually did have a, my thing was glitching out of my end. I've got it fixed. Well, I, I, I actually spoke at quite length to make my point, and I hate to have to go back and repeat it all, but it was, it, it was quite a lengthy <laughs> explanation of the problem. <laughs> the problem is when people say Lord and Savior, uh, or do they mean he's God and Savior, or do they mean he's in charge of my life? I've surrendered my will over to him. He's my Lord. I'm his servant. If that's the case, mm -hmm. then they're misusing it because uh, when Paul says Lord, it's uh, always kurios. It always referring to Jesus being God. Okay, so now, Brother Cripps, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So I, I get where you're coming from. Yes, of course, it, it's referring to him being God. Um, that term... As, as you know, has been thrown around for years. It means lots of different things, as you said, to different people. Um, but in this context, it, it only means the one thing. It means that he's God. When we pray and we, and we use uh, Lord instead of God, it's just, it's just two ways of saying the same thing. Um, it has nothing. So we have a landlord. Um, that's a different connotation it's, it's it's not saying that the person we rent from is our god in any way shape or form in uh british uh parliament and stuff they they use that term to mean just a, it's a, a station uh you're a lord um and even further along the history line than that you're a lord if you own land you uh, that's where the term landlord comes from and it means something different now but um, there were people that didn't own land. They, they worked the land for someone else. They were allowed to live there. And the person that actually owned the land was considered a lord. Um, so it, in the, it is important to understand what it means. Otherwise, you get mixed up with the lordship uh, salvation uh, crowd. And that's what I actually thought you were going to go into, um, uh, making this, the, the distinction between um, uh, people that get wrapped up in, in lordship salvation, but um, I did uh, I did go into that too. That was part of my lengthy explanation. But uh, okay, um, let's, let me ask Brother Steve if if you were heard, heard us this last talk with Brother Cripps, you understand the point now and you want to want to respond to it. Um. Did, did Cripps want to respond to it, or do, or do I? I, I mean, look, I feel like I've already responded. I don't know what you're looking okay. for. Uh, go, go ahead, Steve. Um, okay. Um, th th there's, there's, there's the, there's the uh, heretical idea that you make 
uh, Jesus, your your Lord. In other words, by 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 uh, choosing to follow Him, he, everything um, that is written for us to do. And if you don't do that, you're not making him your personal Lord. But here's the thing. Salvation is either of works or it's of grace. And if it's of works, if you fail to keep one thing, you fail to keep them all and you're, you're damned forever. So it's it, it, you're either saved by grace, not of your own merit, not of not of uh not of your works so that you have nothing to boast in but boast of Christ or uh you 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 try to save yourself through your works and you're you're doomed from the start because not not a single one of us can keep the whole of the law perfectly from birth to death uh and that is what is required and that's what Christ did that he died to give us. That's why the resurrection is so important as it's the pivotal part of the gospel that uh, Christ's uh, death and his life would have meant nothing. Even his perfect life would have meant nothing without his resurrection because his resurrection showed his victory that he had over sin and death and everything else. Um, so getting back to this Lord thing. Christ is Lord. Meaning he is ruler of all. And that word should be a comfort to us. Especially in this verse. That starts out with. Therefore there is now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Why does lordship, the real lordship, not the false lordship salvation of work salvation, why does this lord, be? why should that be a comfort? Why? Because of verses like Christ is the author and finisher of our faith, of our salvation. He is the author and finisher. He is the beginning and the end. He is faithful to complete that which he has started in you. It's not of you. He will finish it. So it's not, it's not um, me that I have to rest in. It's Christ who I rest in because he is Lord. He is ruler. He will make all things complete. I don't have to worry about am I doing enough? Have I tried enough? Have I ran enough? At the end of the day, I rest in Christ because he is Lord over my life. If I screw it up, he'll still fix it. Because he is God, he is Lord, he is King, he is Christ. He is the ever-living one, the Messiah, the Savior. That is who I trust in. Because he will finish it and he will keep me in his hands. He, he will never let me go. Nothing can take me out of, it, out of his hands because he is Lord over me. Not I make him my Lord by doing things. He's Lord because he is the governor supreme. He, he, is, he is the one that's in charge of it all. Because I've placed my trust in him. He makes it perfect in the end. All right. Um, yeah, so uh, the, the point I was, if I was going to just kind of sum it up again, is the, it's sad in my opinion, that uh, a term, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, uh, cannot be celebrated the way I'd like to celebrate it. But instead, I have to be sus suspicious. What do they mean by Lord? And that's unfortunate because so many people, they they when they say Lord, they're not saying thinking in terms of God, they're thinking in terms of some legalistic requirement that they, they've got to surrender their will over to him in order to be saved. So I'll move on now. Verse two is, 
For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Brother Cripps? Yeah, so here it goes back to it again. So if, for those that have been listening um, and have followed along uh, with us on these uh, talks, um, he, he keeps going back to this again and again for the law of the spirit of life in Christ. Um, uh, he, he's used terms already in other, uh, other chapters of the newness in Christ, walking in that, um, having that be uh, part of your uh, daily uh, walk with him. Um, so he's pointing that for the law of the spirit and uh, counterposing that to the end. Again, here's the contrast that Paul is so uh, fond of doing. At the beginning, you have the law of the spirit. At the end, you have the law of sin and death. And um, I, gosh, uh, I just celebrate that, that I'm not under the law of sin and death, but I'm under the law of the spirit, which is to walk in uh, newness of life. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Brother Steve. All right. For the law of the spirit of life is in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death, uh, the, the law, the strength of the law is sin. The law, God's law, God's perfect law, its strength it, it, which Paul says the strength of the law is sin. Why? Because none of us can can keep it. No one can meet it. No one can meet that perfection because we're all flawed from the get-go. Once we know the law, the law condemns us by sin in, unto death. Therefore, Christ died to set us free, to give us freedom. Like Galatians 5, it is for freedom's sake that Christ died to set us free, to be free indeed. And that spirit of life that is Christ, he came to give us life and life more abundantly. So, um, you know, that that is what we are supposed to uh, be resting in, that, that life, uh, that abundance of joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, and love. And the greatest of these is love. That's what we're supposed to be uh, governed under uh, and guided by is those, those things and that we only get through walking with Christ. Um and that starts with belief in Christ. And we can't do any of that without Jesus. And so, yeah. Amen. Thanks, Steve. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I am thankful. Jesus, thank you for the Apostle Paul. Uh, I'm not a Paul onlyist. Uh, there are people who take a good idea. <laughs> too far. Yes, Paul is very, very important and maybe even a little bit more important than the others in the respect that he was the problem solver of the apostles. And the, 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 the problem in the beginning of the church was twofold. They didn't know that Gentiles are included and they didn't know that practicing Judaism has to be discarded. So Paul, in uh, really the primary mission he has, and, and uh, the theme throughout m most of his writings is addressing these problems and co correcting this problem, this mis misunderstanding. And so even right here in these first two verses, you know, he's, he's addressing that, okay, there's no condemnation. Why is he saying that? It's not. It's, he doesn't just say things for ran, ra, just random thoughts. There's a reason. He's saying there's no condemnation because people are telling other, others that there is condemnation. And look, it, it goes. It, it's persisted 
all through all of church history and today we still see people every day and in the chat room right now there's people who can't get over it and let's be like paul let's just say come on there's no condemnation get over it accept it if you don't some people don't understand it from the get-go and if they don't understand it from the get-go then they're not even christians because that's what christianity is coming to the understanding belief that the problem solved by jesus and i'm going to heaven because what jesus did for me is guaranteed and when you understand that you won't have any condemnation but sometimes people understand that then they fall go astray and get apostate and that's very unfortunate but that'll take away your joy and your peace your blessed assurance and um, that's unfortunate. And I see it in, in, even in our own uh, congregation. It's still popping up where people are bringing up the worry. They're worried about this and that. And, and, uh, if, and it's all, if you're worrying about these things, then you don't realize it's not about you. It's about Jesus. Do you really believe that Jesus did it all? Do you believe what he actually accomplished your salvation for you? And then the second, the second verse here, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made us free from the law. Oh, it's a shame, Paul. I mean, I can understand Paul having to straighten that out. And all through the, the epistles and the book of Acts, you see the problem being addressed all those years, all, for ver three or four decades of the beginning of the church, you see the, a record of it in the Bible. Um, and then if you really study church history, you'll see that it's, it's the problem that's persisted all along. And it's the problem we deal with every day. But, you, hey, can't we just recognize now that uh, you know, we're, we, are you free? Or were you made free from the, the, the demands of the law? If not, there's a big problem. You don't understand the gospel if you if you don't if you're not free from the law. I'm going to read it in the Amplified and see how it phrases it. Um, Good point, brother Luke. I just wanted to. I, I wish more people understood that, and um, I just wanted to say briefly, real quick, before we do the Amplified. I like how you uh, Hendricks put in the chat. He said thorn e equals uh, Jude does uh, Jude is a uh, how do you say that? Judaizer. Anyway. Judaizers. Judaizers. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Judaizers destroying Paul's hard work and preaching equals the flesh. Uh, Paul was getting pissed off at them for it. Um, one thing is for sure, uh, as Brother Luke has pointed out, in talking about the thorn being the, the either a person or persons who were constantly trying to thwart his ministry. And uh, that may very well be true. Uh, it's definitely something to look at. And I uh, tend to agree with uh, Brother Luke rather than some people said it was uh, some kind of his blindness was his thorn in the flesh or some kind of stomach problem. Or, I mean, they theorize all kinds of stuff. This makes more sense when, you, when you're reading this chapter by chapter like we're doing and it's being laid out. He keeps going back to the same points again and again and again. And as we've said, the reason why is because people are still struggling with it today. I believe that God wanted us to see that back then and that now it's still a problem. And that's why he keeps doing that. All right. Sorry, Brother Luke. Go ahead. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I'm pretty confident that the uh, thorn in the flesh uh, is about the, the false teachers that are uh, trying to ruin Paul's uh, churches. But uh, and, and even if that term doesn't apply to that, if, if that term does apply to some physical ailment, that's okay, because it's clear throughout the scriptures that the problem does exist where he's being accused of being a false apostle, and he has to defend his apostleship, defend his teachings, and the accusations that he's giving people license to sin. Paul saying you don't have to follow the commandments, you don't have to get circumcised. So he's constantly defending himself from these people. And whether whether it's correct to refer to those uh, Judaizers, these false teachers, uh, as a thorn in the flesh, okay, you don't have to agree on that. But uh, the the fact is they they were a big problem for Paul, and they're, they're a problem for us. 
look at Renee. Uh, you know, she's just, unfortunately, Renee really gets hurt by it. You have to learn to, to deal with it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's hard, but uh, um, we have to know that hey, it's, it, it's not a new problem. We're in good company. If we're being attacked for the same things Paul, Paul was attacked for, then we know we're doing something right. Let me read it in the Amplified. Uh, it says, um, uh, for the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of our new being has set you free from the law of sin and of death. All right. Okay, nothing really profound in that uh, amplification. Let me go to verse three. Oh, did uh, everybody's had a chance to talk about verse two, right? Okay, verse three. Verse three in the KJV says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. So verse 3 and 4 go together, so I read them together. Um, brother, uh, Let's ask Brother Steve to go first this time. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. By the way, uh, putting three and four together, uh, you got quite a bit to read in the Amplified when we're done because they really amplify it, verse three and four. Um, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh um, because the flesh is weak. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a backwards way of stating the flesh is weak. That's why we can't keep the law. That's why the law could not do it because the flesh is weak. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. That's why the virgin birth. That's why it, Christ was not born from the first Adam, but born of the spirit so that he would be born in flesh, but not of the her, uh, her, her, hereditary sinful flesh. Um, so that's partly what makes God, Christ, both God and man at the same time. But uh, that's why God sent his own son, because we were weak to keep the law in the flesh. Uh, and that could go uh, back to some prophecy in, in the book of Daniel that so many years was given for them to uh, end transgression. And that was a prophecy about the Messiah in part, but uh, I won't go there. And for so God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So he sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. It looks like the, the same kind of flesh that you and I wear that is the result of the first Adam and came as the second Adam to die for our sin and condemn sin in the flesh by living a perfect life. He condemned sin so that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us because he condemned it in the flesh by his righteousness. When he took on his, our sin, he would give us the righteousness of the law be fulfilled in us because we trust in him because we have the spirit. And we no, no longer walk after the flesh, but after the spirit, because we're born again. Paul here again is in verse four is restating the battle in part um, in, uh, in, in um, but we no longer serve the flesh, but the flesh still serves sin. But with our mind, we serve the law of God. 
and our spirit has our, has been born again. So we have this dichotomy of voices, but because of what Christ did, his righteousness is fulfilled in us because he gives it to us by faith. It's imputed. That's how it's fulfilled because we trusted in him. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm going to make it easy for Brother Cripps. Uh, I posted the uh, uh, Amplified in your private chat space there, Brother Cripps. So I'm going to read the Amplified for you and, and then give me your feedback on that. Verses 3 and 4 in the Amplified says, For what the law could not do, that is, overcome sin and remove its penalty, its power, being weakened by the flesh, man's nature without the Holy Spirit, God did. He sent his own son in the likeness of sinful man as an offering for sin. And he condemned sin in the flesh. That is, he subdued it and overcame it in the person of his own son. For so that the righteous and just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not live our lives in the ways of the flesh. That is, we're guided by worldliness and our sinful nature, but we live our lives in the ways of the Spirit. So we're guided by His power. Brother Cripps? Yeah, well, you you did you did do me a favor because after Steve had covered it so well, I was just planning on saying ditto and moving, moving forward. But <laughs> um, yeah, so the Amplified definitely uh, makes it very, very simple to understand. And um, I appreciate the lengths that they go to here. So he uh, he basically, just to double down on what Steve said as well, he, he put on the flesh, and this is refers to something I've talked about a lot. He put the flesh on except for the fact that he did not sin. So in doing that, it condemned sin in the flesh. And then so now that we walk uh, with the Holy Spirit, uh, now, each time that we choose to walk in that, we're walking in the victory that Christ did for us on the cross. We're walking in that, in that newness of life. It, 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 it's a powerful, powerful thing. And thanks for the Amplified, Brother Luke. And I'll keep it short. All right. Uh, well, there's I so much. Make one comment on there, okay. if I might, on yeah, the yeah. Amplified. Um that uh, the way they worded it, and especially in verse four, I have a little bit of problem with the the idea of being guided by and live our lives. Um, you know, uh, it, it the the way they worded it there has a leaning towards the lordship salvation, um, and I think it's important to to note that. Um, the way we live our lives has nothing to do with our salvation, um, but it has everything to do with uh, whether we are glorifying God or not in our lives so that others may be saved. But our, our, our flesh, what Paul talked about in chapter seven and several other places that the flesh is not guided by anything but sin. Um, that's why the flesh still serves sin, but we serve God with our with our with our uh, our our soul, our mind, our will, and our, our emotions. That's where the battleground takes place between between the flesh and and the spirit. And that's why we're supposed to, with our mind, will, and emotions, serve the will of God. And that, and by doing so, we crucify the flesh. That's how we crucify the flesh. But we are still always going to be guided by, by the spirit, but it's not in our choosing to be guided by the spirit that, that makes us or keeps us saved it's it's God who does the saving. We receive the saving by faith, through faith, by Christ, through faith, and through grace, by grace. Um, so I think it's just important to note that um, uh, sometimes I, I, I think they did it better in verse 1 where they uh, showed the walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. 
as those who are either believers or, or not believers, um, instead of how they said guided by and uh, the live our the way we live our lives is somehow a distinction um, of those who are saved and not. Uh, I don't like how they put that there in verse four, because it's not in our works of righteousness, which we have done, but it's by his mercy that he saves us. Um, and it's not in our, our righteousness, which is filthy rags. It's not in the good works or the, or the bad works that we don't do. Um, all of that. It has nothing to do with our salvation. It's Christ alone. Amen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, it's good, Steve, to uh, always be on the lookout. That's why uh, I insist on, let's read the KJV first, and then we can read the Amplified or any other translation that you, you like and you think there is beneficial. But we always want to contrast it to the KJV. And uh, when there is a uh, different point of view expressed, I have to go with the KJV's um, conclusion uh, as scripture, just like when Steve or, or Cripps or Renee or I, when we're amplifying on a verse, uh, I, you know, I, I have to test everything we all say as we amplify or expound on a verse. I have to consider that too and be, be uh, cautious to, you know, scrutinize it and see if it, if what we're all saying is, uh, agrees with this, with the scripture or not. So, uh, yeah, we need to be diligent. And I have found on a few occasions where the Amplified, it, it's not as bad as NIV and, and some of the others uh, where it's really quite common. Uh, but sometimes in the KJV, I'll see them explain it in a way that is a repentive sin idea or, or lordship I, salvation idea is, has crept in. So they are not perfect, and we got to always be on the lookout for it. Now, I, I do think, though, that we also have to keep in mind that uh, Paul was accused of being antinomian, as, as, you know, just against the law. Don't, but we can see that Paul uh, talks about the law all the time, and the, and the, 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 but he explains the real value of the law, the real purpose of the law, um, so he's not against the law at all, as long as we uh, understand it's and the, the, the correct way to apply it in our lives. Um, so, but let's look at verse four in the KJV here. And I'm not, I don't think that um, what they're saying is necessarily uh, different than the KJV from what I saw here. It says uh, uh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. So, uh, um, See, this is not talking about the imputed righteousness. This is, this is talking about us following law, uh, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So this is not talking about uh, the, uh, the, the salvation, the free gift, the imputed righteousness. This is talking about, okay, uh, I'm, you're, you're righteous, you've got the imputed righteousness, but now the law is fulfilled if you're walking after the spirit instead of after the flesh. And that's what I'm getting out of verse four in the KJV. So I don't see any error in the Amplified the way they're expressing it, but we do need to be on guard for it all, all the time. But let's not also go, it's so easy to, for any of us to um, take a good idea a little bit too far. And we want to defend uh, faith alone so perfectly uh but then hey we also don't want to go so far as to to act like well we don't have any responsibility after we get saved we we still uh god does desire that we are law abiding but not through the, the flesh by just letting the spirit take over our life and talk about lordship that's that's what we're supposed to do after we believe and we have the holy spirit living in us we should be surrendering our will over to the holy spirit letting the holy spirit take control and transform our desires and and our our um, thoughts and deeds change um so um it, 
Now, there's another thing that's important to understand about the law. This is probably the biggest mistake I find um, when people, Christians, talk about the law, is that the, the law, really, that he's referring to here, are the laws of Moses. And the laws of Moses were not given to uh, Rome or, or, or Galatia or Ephesia or, you know, the laws of Moses were given to Israel. The laws were not of Moses were not given to the United States of America or, or uh, you know, any place in the world. It's only Israel. Uh, but we we are under law, the law of conscience. Paul says that we've got the law written in our heart by God giving us a conscience. Uh, see, we've inherited when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They uh, they understood right and wrong. And that understanding is something that's passed down through all of us. We have all inherited that, the, uh, the knowledge of right and wrong. So we, we, we don't have an excuse saying like we don't know any better because God gave us everybody a conscience. All right, let me go to the next verse. Uh, this is uh, verse um, 6 in the KJV. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So, uh, Brother Cripps, but uh, I want to ask, ask you in the form of a question. Uh, to be spiritually minded instead of carnally minded, uh, do you have a choice about that? <laughs> you, you laid it right out there for me. Yes, absolutely, we do have a choice. Uh, we have a choice every day. I love the verse about the the uh, by the transformation, the daily renewing of our minds. We're transformed daily by the Holy Spirit. Uh, we we get up, we uh, put on our armor, we get ready for the day, we uh, spend time with God, and in that, the Holy Spirit renews us and gets us ready. Uh, there there are new mercies every day. And we, we definitely have that choice. And, and Paul's continually making that clear um, in saying when we, when we decide, it doesn't say decide, but when we uh, walk in the spirit instead of the flesh, making that distinction. So verse 6, to, to be carnally minded is death. Again, he's making that same point. The law, uh, the law is death. Uh, to be carnally minded, um, to focus, as verse 5 says, to be mind the things of the flesh. So again, we're minding zombie things instead of the spirit things. And then to be spiritually minded is life and peace, which is absolutely a choice. Um, and it's going to be a choice until this flesh is ripped away from us and we're able to just be the perfected being that is our uh, future promise and Christ being the first fruits. Thanks, Brother Luke. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Brother Steve. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we're doing verses five and six. Uh, then uh, I think we did four and five together now. So now we're just doing six. Uh, well, actually, we did, we did three we and did four. Three and four. Yeah. So that's where I was confused. Oh, let me let me look back. I'm confusing myself now. Okay. okay. We did three and four. Um, oh yeah, I'm sorry. I, I I posted six, seven, and eight in the for you guys in the private space and, and forgot where I was. Yes. So uh, yeah, do um, yeah, do five and uh, and sit and. Yeah, five and six. Do five and six, Steve, and then uh, we'll get back, back to seven and eight after that. Okay. Um, so uh, it's kind of a continuation. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, uh, the, the things of the spirit. So, um, uh, and then uh, verse six, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Uh, sorry, I needed a drink. My throat's getting uh, a little 
rough. Um, I'm sick if you can't tell. Um, so, um, basically what you were saying, Luke, I totally agree with. Uh, and I think that, that Paul is talking about both ends of the thing. Um, he's talking about the fulfillment of, uh, of the, of the law, uh, th that the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us, fulfilled in us in two ways, um, through Christ and our, our trust and faith in him. And by that, when we walk after the spirit, that when we're living according to the spirit, um, Um, uh, that, that when we walk after the spirit, we are always going to be doing the opposite of what the flesh wants. Um, so the, the law is fulfilled then by doing that. Uh, so when, when we are carnally minded, we're setting our, our, our mind on things of the flesh that bring death in our lives, whether it be death to your finances, death to your emotions, death to whatever, including physical death, up to and including physical death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So that is when we fulfill the, the righteousness of the law, which is when we're living according to the two, uh, how Christ summed up the law, that is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang both the law and the prophets. Yes. And that's what Christ came to fulfill in that he said in Matthew 5. That he, he came to fulfill. And not one jot, not one tittle would be would be done away with until all be fulfilled. And he said it is finished to tell us die. So he is the fulfillment of the law, the righteousness of the law that he gives to us as believers. So it's twofold fulfillment. It's fulfillment ultimately because when, when, we, when we believed and trusted on him as Savior, that he gives us the imputed righteousness and the seal of the Holy Spirit which is the which is the earnest of the purchase possession? It's the down payment uh, uh, on on the purchased house that we have yet to see the glorified body that we will get. That is our our what we're waiting on our inheritance. So um, that's the ultimate fulfillment. That is uh, the righteousness of God, which is which is. Uh, comes the law comes from God, the righteousness there, the glory of God. But uh, as we walk in the Spirit and according to the Spirit, the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us as we are light and salt in the earth. That's what we're supposed to do as believers so that we uh, preach the gospel with not just our words, but our actions and how we walk uh, in this world. And give glory to God so that others may see and praise God as well and, and be saved. Glory to God. Indeed, brother. Uh, I'd like to read a couple more verses though in the, in the amplified and then brother Cripps, you can talk about this. So I'll read five through eight here. So we have, a, because these, this is kind of like a long run on thought, you know, Paul is known for, run on sentences a one sentence can be like you know you're tempted to put a couple of periods in there but it, 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 the thoughts are all connected so <laughs> starting with verse, verse of five for those who are living according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh which gratify the body but those who are living according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit his will and purpose. Now the mind of the flesh is death, both now and forever, because it pursues sin. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace, the spiritual well-being that comes from walking with God, both now and forever. The mind of the flesh, with its sinful pursuits, 
is actively hostile to God. It does not submit itself to God's law since it cannot. And those who are in the flesh, living a life that caters to sinful appetites and impulses, cannot please God. Brother Cripps, that's pretty well spelled out for you. Yeah, I don't even have to say anything. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> yeah, so uh, going those four verses, so to just to re reiterate, so again, he's talking ab uh, about when we when we decide to walk in our flesh suit, our zombie suit, we follow the things that a zombie follows. And those, uh, for the sake of discussion as far as today's standards are concerned, are definitely the things of the flesh. It's everything that's not of spirit, which is, uh, the you know, the lust that we have, pornography, drinking, um, I mean, alcoholism, um, uh, spousal abuse, all, all, all the things that you can possibly think of and walk after those things. Um, we're making that choice not to do that. And then if we're doing the spiritual things, all the things that God tells us tells us that that we should do to focus on things that are lovely things that are pure things that, that are, are of good report etc we're supposed to think on those things and walk in those things and with the holy spirit he helps us to do that he walks side by side with us we make that decision uh to to every day do that and he he is right there to renew our minds and transform us in that way um i love verse seven uh it makes it very very clear because when we're the, the carnal mind itself or, or walking in the flesh, it, it is enmity against God, absolutely, uh, because it's not subject to the law of God, uh, neither indeed can be. It can't be. It, it, God, that's why Christ came. We could not do it because we were weak in the flesh. The flesh was weak, and we could not follow the laws. So that's why he sent his son to do that to, to put on the flesh suit and do it for us, thereby freeing us from our uh, former zombie lifestyle and into a, a lifestyle full of life and walking in the newness of Christ, which is absolutely the way uh, we should do it. Um, so verse eight, so then they that are uh, that are in the flesh cannot please God. Um, if we're his children and we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, it this verse simply means that when we're walking in just the flesh, we cannot please him. If we're walking in the spirit, he's already pleased with us. And that's exactly the, the, what he uh, wants us to do every day. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think that... Uh... Well, they amplified it, you know, um, made it very clear. But I think the point that uh, I want to make sure everybody understands is that uh, it is a decision that we get to make. And we are all making this decision, whether, whether we even realize it or not, uh, to walk in the flesh in the spirit. Now, if we do walk in the, in the flesh, and Paul talks about, you know, God's not pleased with it, and we're and we're uh, you know it's consequences. It's not good. Uh, but uh, how do you, how can you walk in the spirit? You know, is it is it beyond your control? You don't have any choice. No, it, walking in the spirit is is it's like um, it's like everything else in life. If we were not talking about the Bible and and uh, Christianity right now, we're just talking about uh, how to be a successful person. In life, um, oops, um, you you don't get successful in life accidentally. It, it, it takes some effort on your part, and a lot of right decisions and right habits have to be put in place to to become successful. Uh, you, you, if you let's say you want to be successful by being you know healthy, and you want to be uh, successful in, in a career and you want to be successful financially. Well, none of these things just, just fall into your lap. Uh, so you have to, uh, it, spiritually, the same thing is true, but what can we do? Well, to get strong physically, we exercise and we 
eat good food. To get strong spiritually, we exercise and get good food. So we, the food is the word of God. But the Bible says that uh, we don't live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. So the, the Bible, the word of God is considered food for us. And so we, if we're in the Bible every day, getting our nutrition, our spiritual nutrition from it, and then we're getting our exercise by working in a ministry effort, doing something for the cause. I, we're called to be uh, ministers or servants for Jesus. And if you don't know what your calling is and you need, that's the first order of business you need to do. Pray and until you get an answer from the Lord about what he wants you to do. And it, it's probably gonna be related to the natural talents that you have and, uh, and, and using your, your God-given talents for the church. Uh, and another type of exercise uh, is prayer. And that's how you build, develop your relationship with Jesus. And, and uh, as you're doing these things and having fellowship with other believers, instead of, instead of having fellowship with the world and, and being, letting them influence you and having all the temptations of the world to deal with, it's very easy to get in the flesh if you're dealing with fleshly, worldly people all the time and that's your environment you're living in, then you're gonna have all these fleshly temptations and it's gonna be difficult. But if you're having fellowship with other believers and you're you're all uh, you know your focal point is Jesus and 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 helping uh, helping others, then these things are going to be much much easier to accomplish, and you'll grow into a mature, productive Christian. So Paul basically saying it to us that uh, we should be walking in the Spirit rather than the flesh, and it, it's clear that it's up to you to do it. It, you have you have the ability to walk in the spirit, but it will take a decision on your part. That that's what I want to do. And how can I accomplish it? Study your Bible every day, have fellowship with other believers every day, get busy working for Jesus some, somehow, and constantly pray, pray. Your default should be, you should be praying every minute of the day. Now that sounds extreme and insane, I think. Most people would think, how can, how is that possible? Well, Paul says, continue instant in prayer. <laughs> That's a strange way of structuring a sentence, is it? Continue instant in prayer. And to me, that means that I'm praying as a default. Uh, matter of fact, that's what I do. When I wake up, the minute I wake up, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to, I hope it doesn't come off as boasting. I'm just telling you, this is a habit that I've developed. When I wake up, I'm praying it. As soon as I wake up, I'm immediately talking to Jesus and praying. And, and then my prayer continues through the day, except when it's interrupted by my mind has to be busy on something. But when my mind is not required on something, then the default is continue instantly in the prayer, the conversation with Jesus. And when you, when you develop these habits, then you will be walking in the spirit. All right, we'll go on, but any more feedback on that? Yeah, I do want to give you feedback. I'm so glad you brought that up. So it is not boasting for you to just say that the first thing you get up, you talk to your father. I, not only is it not boasting, but we, we should all be doing that. And I'm not saying that in a, in a condemning way, because as we've already cleared up, but Paul said it for us, there's no condemnation. I'm certainly not operating in that. Um, I even sometimes when I wake up in the middle of the night and have to use the restroom, um, I'll just talk to him a little bit. Praying is not just having to be on your knees before God. And I do that as well. And I enjoy that. But it's not just doing that in that in that one way. It's talking to him any chance we get. That's all it is. He just wants relationship with us. That's all. So we can do that anytime. We can do that in our head, too. And the evil one can't understand what we're, what's even being said. That he can't read our minds. So whether we pray audibly or in our minds or when we're driving down the road or first thing, as Brother Luke said, when he wakes up, which is what I do as well, um, it's it's precious to him. He wants that relationship. And, and uh, gosh, and I've done this in the past, too. I mean, I, I've grown, I grew up with my parents making it a point to teach me how to pray. I always thought it was like this. And then I'd hear other people talk about, yeah, I need to 
find time to pray. I said, you have time every day. Well, you don't understand how busy I am. Well, you're busy all day and you can take you can take time doing whatever you're doing and still pray in your mind to him. He just wants to share share your life. That's all it is. It doesn't have to be a big thing. And then when you have time to yourself, you know, people make it where it does get to boasting is when people um, seem to feel like it's necessary to describe, you know, how I, every, when I get home, I get go into my prayer closet and I get on my knees and I spend four hours in prayer. I don't need to know you spend four hours in prayer. I, I spend all my waking life in prayer because I make it a point to talk to him. And this is something I that the more I practice it, it's part of growing close to God and he draws near to you. It's, it's part of seeking him, even though, even though I know he's already with me. It's, it's a way of relating to my father. He's, he's our daddy. I, he, he wants that with us. Thank you, Brother Luke. I'm glad you brought that up. That's all I have to say about it. All right, Brother Steve, any more before we go to verse 9? Uh, yes, I thought that was incredibly important to note, especially when we're talking about um, the flesh, uh, you know, is, is in enmity against God and that that the spirit is the opposite what it wars against is is the opposite of what the flesh wars for so when especially when you talk about prayer uh that's one of the reasons why uh fasting with prayer um is 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 extremely important because um uh when when uh the i think it's first five uh, in the Amplified, I think, makes it uh, kind of clear here. For those who are living according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh, which gratify the body. As Jesus uh, said to uh, the, the, the devil in, in his temptation, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the, out of the mouth of God, that that is how we, you know, crucify the flesh is by living according to the word of God. And when we fast and pray, we're, uh, the, the idea of that is we are living solely on the word of God during those periods of time. And um, I believe God delights in that, that we do that and that uh, our walk grows closer to him because of that. And um, I think when we do that, we we'll, we learn more to align our will with His will. Uh, so, yeah, I just I just wanted to point that out that that's part of the reason for fasting along with prayer. But prayer in and of itself, you don't have to have a closet or anything like that to pray. You don't have to have a place where you kneel every day to pray though those things are good and and right to do uh like luke and jason were saying that um you can pray any time of the day and and always be in communication with god it doesn't you don't have to have a specific place to do that uh um you can do that all the time and they can they can throw you in jail. They could sew up your lips, and you can still pray and worship God in your mind. For as Paul said, it's with the mind we serve God. Yes, Amen. Uh, <clears throat> I noticed that uh, Sister Renee is in the chat room now. So, uh, hi, hi, Sister. Glad you're at least able to uh, <clears throat> be in the chat room. I told everybody about your situation at the beginning, and I'm sure everybody's praying for you. Uh, now, verse uh, 9 uh, is really defines what a Christian is. Um, it says, uh, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. <laughs> uh, 
Now we know that uh, uh, there's a particular way that we get the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And uh, we know it's not by religious works, it's by faith alone in Christ alone. But Paul's saying here, what defines someone as a Christian is you have the Spirit of Christ living in you. So uh, go ahead, Brother Cripps. That's yeah. A profound, very profound verse, isn't it? It's beautiful. Yes, it's very profound. So, but you are not in the flesh. We're not in the flesh, guys. We're in the flesh as far as walking around this flesh suit. But we do not have to walk in the flesh. We've been freed from that. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times, and I've done this too, we're like dogs to our own vomit. It's like we know that we don't have to walk in the flesh, but sometimes we do. And when we do, then he lovingly um, uh, corrects us. Uh, you know, and sometimes it seems like we get away with something when we walk in the flesh, but we always carry around the idea, uh, and knowing that we're not supposed to do that. And, and the, the more we walk towards him, I like the way you said that, uh, the more and more we walk with him, the, the, the better it gets, the easier it gets not to go back to that flesh, like a dog to its vomit. Um, yes, it is profound. Uh, in that he makes the statement, he makes it very clear. So if we, if we have that spirit in us, we're of God. If we don't have the spirit, then we're none of his. We're not his children. We're not joint heirs with Christ. We're not adopted into God's family. We're none of his. We have no part of that. So this is a, a, a huge distinction, and it makes it very, very clear. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Now, Brother Steve, uh, b before you respond to verse 9, I'll read it in the Amplified, and so you can critique that and see if it's, uh, if it's uh, helpful or not. However, you are not living in the flesh that is controlled by the sinful nature, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God lives in you, directing and guiding you. But... If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him and is not a child of God. Did we lose Steve? Uh, no, I just okay. had my mic down. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, all right. No problem. I didn't know if you were aware. We weren't being able to hear you. Okay. Sorry. Uh, okay. Um, anyway, uh, yes, there is the distinction at the end of verse 9. Uh, the distinction between a believer and an unbeliever is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Christ, uh, that Christ sent the Comforter uh, in his place. Uh, he said, if I leave not, the Comforter can't come. So because he left, and, and the comforter would come, and that is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. And those who have the Holy Ghost are children of God, and those who do not have the Holy Ghost are not children of God. And because we have the Holy Spirit in us, we are no longer controlled by the sinful nature uh, in, in our mind and uh, our spirit which is born again and sealed, set apart by God, the flesh must be destroyed because the flesh still serves sin. But we are not under its bondage, nor under its uh, curse of punishment that Christ paid for us. So we can choose as believers to... Uh, live to honor and glorify God and serve the one that, that saved us, or we can choose to serve the one that has kept us in bondage and still be willfully bound, but we are not truly bound because we've been set free. So why that Paul is kind of starting his argument uh, uh, and continuing an argument of why serve the one that had you bound? The one, why keep serving that way? Let's serve God. 
let's let's serve him let's stop living for the devil and live for christ um because you are saved because you have the spirit of god in you um you know uh the 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 idea they're controlled by um where Paul said in chapter seven, I find this law at work with, but with, you know, with, with my flesh, my flesh serves the law of sin with my mind. I serve the law of God. He, he's again, distinguishing that here, the flesh is still control is still sin, but my mind is no longer held captive by sin. I can now choose to follow God and to follow his will in my life. And that's what we should be doing as believers. Um, and that should is a key distinction. It has nothing to do with my eternal salvation. It has everything to do with uh, glorifying God in the present age and helping others to be saved by my actions and my words. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. well we if you were not with us last week when we studied chapter 7 I have to remind everybody that in chapter 7 Paul teaches that he personally was in the flesh and he personally was carnal and he had a war, a battle going on between his old Paul with the flesh against the new man, the inner man, the spiritual man that was born again spiritually from above. And he not only said that this is an absolute, that all of us are dealing with it, confessing how his own struggles with this and that this is inevitable. But now he's saying in this chapter, I think he's being generous. He's saying to them, to the same people, uh, he says, uh, you are not living in the flesh controlled by the sinful nature, but in the spirit. Uh, he's, he's not saying that you, you believers in the church of Rome you you got it, man. You got the, you got it beat, man. You've mastered it. You don't you don't ever get in the flesh. You're perfect, always in the spirit. Um, right after the last chapter, saying that no, this is this is the struggle of all of us. So, but he, I believe at this point he's being kind to them and generous in an encouraging way, saying you're doing a good job, okay. Um, but at the same time, recognizing that uh, hey as he's talking about here is that, hey, sometimes we are not in the, in the, in the spirit, we get in the flesh, but we have a choice and uh, we need to make an effort to, to stay in the spirit. Um, so uh, it, be careful uh, to take this, a verse like this and apply it to you personally today and, and as an absolute that you, if you're a Christian, you don't ever walk in the, in the flesh, you walk in the spirit because none of us do that all the time. I mean, after Paul's great confession in chapter seven, there should be nobody arguing that <laughs> Paul couldn't do it, but I do it. Okay. It should be clear, right, Brother Luke? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, let's, uh, let's go to the next verse, verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Steve, why don't you go first on that one? Can't hear you, Steve. Oh, darn it. There you go. You're darn welcome. it. You got it now. Sorry. Um, Awesome verse, I was saying. Awesome verse. But they're all awesome verses because it's all the word of God written down. The written word. It's awesome. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. 
but the spirit is the life because of righteousness. So the body is dead. We reckon it dead. He's trying to, to convince you of the fact that your body is going to die. It is dead. It cannot be reborn. It is the spirit and and the soul that is that is reborn. We are waiting on the adoption of our bodies, of the glorified body, the, the body we will be given. That's what we're waiting on. But it's dead because of sin. Meaning it's it's cursed, it's it's useless, it's futile, it has uh its importance is um irrelevant is really irrelevant in the grand scheme of things um because of sin that this body is dead but the spirit is life because of righteousness because of god's righteousness um and that 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 life which is by the spirit is in the son um is in christ because of Christ righteousness. Uh, I'm I'm looking over at the Amplified, which says, which is which he provides <laughs> at the end of the verse. Uh, it's because of the righteousness which he, which he provides, which Christ provides to us through his Spirit, um, and that is so true. So you know uh, the the rest we have in Christ that's given to us that is both eternal and learned um, that as we grow in him, we, we should be learning more and more to rest and trust in him for all things, not just our salvation. That's why Christ tells us to worry not, you know, about all the things that you have no control over. Do what you can and leave the rest in God's hands and trust and know that his, his, he will, he is faithful. He is faithful to complete that which he has started in you. And he will carry it on to, to completion. That I'm just along for the ride and I will do the best I can. But at the end of the day, it is Christ who finishes what he started in me. Um, and so that uh, I think that's what you know Paul is really trying to get at that that you know uh is is to con to to compel us to convince us to to exhort us to walk after the things of the spirit and and in so doing because you're walking after the things of the spirit, you're not walking after the things of the flesh, so that as we live our lives. By doing that, we fulfill the law of Christ in us, and we don't fulfill the law of sin and death in our lives and bring death and destruction in our lives, even though we've already been set free of that law eternally. Let's live our lives so that our current lives match the gift we've been given. That's what Paul is really, to sum it up, let's live our lives to match the gift we've already been given. Yeah. Uh, well, Brother Cripps, uh, uh, he, he did cite the uh, Amplified, and I, I want to read the, the Amplified now for you. And it says, if Christ lives in you, though your natural body is dead because of sin, your spirit is alive because of righteousness, which he provides. All right, all right, all right. So uh, the Amplified makes it very, very clear. And it even uses the word natural. So it's making it clear what they're, what it's referring to, the natural body, the body that we're given. The Steve said um, he's along for the ride. So I was going to make the analogy that um, this thing that we're in, this flesh, is simply just a vehicle. It's a means to an end to get us from the beginning of our life when we're born into this realm to the end of our life 
when finally that flesh, that vehicle that we've been riding around in, it's it's it served its purpose, was which is to transport the spirit that is within us to be the hands and feet of God, to be salt and light for the earth through the spirit, not from the flesh. The flesh, God is so good. He made all these things, these automatic systems in us, our heart. Our lungs breathe on their own. You don't have to tell yourself to breathe. You don't have to tell your heart to beat. You do not have to tell your blood to travel uh, through your veins and arteries to get to different parts of your body. Uh, it does all that for us. So it is just a vehicle, the same way you use a car to get from point A to point B. So point A is our birth into this, it, to this broken world that is ravaged by sin. And we're our, our, vehicle is born into that way in the same way that it's dead. But uh, the B from point A to point B, B is, as Steve was referencing, is to when we get to the end, that thing that we're waiting for, that thing that we long for, which is uh, actually going to be summed up for us in the next verse, but I'll, I won't uh, step ahead. Um, that point in which our bodies are, these flesh bodies go into the grave, our spirit goes back to the God that made us, and we wait for our uh, eternal bodies. Or, 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 we don't even have to actually physically die, but if we live long enough for Christ to return, then He quickens our bodies and puts gives us uh, in, into the uh, the the new eternal body, and we may not even have to taste physical death. Either way, this body is useless at, at, at the point in which we either die or Christ comes uh, again and we're changed in the blink of an eye. Um, great stuff. Beautiful verse. Thank you, guys. Uh, yeah, it's... Um, I don't want to jump ahead in the, the whole chapter and, and give away what's coming up next, but... Uh, the idea of um, this natural body uh, we're going to we, we've already been provided righteousness but our righteousness is uh, it's it's imputed but we still have this body that's not righteous this body is flesh it's sinful nature so we have this uh, this issue right I coined the phrase last week that sounds to me like Paul is schizophrenic the way he's describing this conflict going on in his life and the struggle he's two like two different people and uh, but we know that uh, as the chapter goes on that, that there's a promise that that's temporary problem and we won't have that problem once we get the, the resurrection uh, let me read the KJV for the next verse is, um, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So that's what this verse is about the idea that uh, this mortal body that we have that has the sin nature it, this is a temporary thing uh, there's going to come a point where uh, where our bodies are going to be quickened and uh, um, resurrected just like Jesus was verse 12 therefore brethren we are debtors not to the flesh uh, to live after the flesh for if ye live after the flesh ye shall die but if ye, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I covered a lot of ground, but I thought that all that's, uh, and there's even more. Uh, the next verse, I, I'll, I'll read the next verse. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So to me, verse 15 goes back to verse 1, where it's saying, and verse 2, where it says, you're not under condemnation, and you're free from the law. And then in verse 15, he's saying, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage. 
no, so I will make the same point that I've been making repeatedly here and almost every time we we talk I keep on making this point I am seeing so many believers that don't have joy they're, they're worried about their salvation they're they don't have peace and why is that uh, if, if you don't have joy and peace and uh, assurance of your salvation then you don't have the right gospel now you may have had the right gospel and got confused I believe that does happen but uh, if you do understand the gospel and believe the gospel I don't see how it's possible to have the doubts and, and, and fears and, and uh, an absence of joy and peace. They go together. And when you understand that the gospel is the good news, that it's guaranteed, it's settled, it's finished, it's irrevocable, it's irreversible. I got eternal life, I'm going to heaven, nothing can change that. And when you, when you understand and believe that, how could you not have joy and peace and certainty and the blessed assurance? And that's what Paul's saying, he keeps inserting the ideas. Come on, you're not under bondage. All right, uh, Brother Cripps, I covered several verses there, but go ahead and give me your thoughts on through verse 15. Yep, no problem whatsoever. So all these are, are uh, Paul's reiterating some of the same stuff, but in, in verse 11, he uses that uh, that word again. There's that quicken. That qu I love that word. I always have. So um uh in previous um verses or previous chap uh chapters that we've gone over in romans it was uh talking about quickening the spirit and making the spirit alive and walk in the newness of life okay so here he has the he's he's saying now that the, the we can look forward as steve mentioned we're looking forward to when he does this with our body when when we're we're moved into our eternal home, our eternal bodies, and he uses that same word again in the same way that he quickened our spirit internally, he then will quicken our bodies, and that's what we uh, we look forward to. However, he's adding here that while we're still in these flesh suits, if we're walking in the spirit, then we're we're dwelling in that thing that he's done for us by his spirit. We're walking in that quickened spirit. Um, so verse 12, therefore, uh, we are not debtors, uh, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. That's that's pretty simple. Oh, I was reading it, and then I, uh, I added the other thing. I got to go back up. Just give me one second. All right. So um, therefore, we are not debtors. So we don't owe anything uh, to the flesh because we're not living after the flesh as long as we don't uh, live there. If we're believers, we're not, we don't owe anything to the flesh whatsoever. Uh, so 13, if we live after the flesh, you shall die. It's the same point that we've been making this whole, this whole, uh, time when we were talking through Romans, um, we live after the flesh and, uh, we don't have to do that. Uh, we, we can, we can walk. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, we can walk in life instead of death. That's the, that's the whole point. Um, all right. So the one I wanted to talk about is just the, uh, the, uh, verse 15, the most, um, this is, this is so good here. And this should bring joy to, to those people that are struggling as brother Luke pointed out. Um, and it, it's so hard to watch. It's so hard to watch people that could have assurance if they just would would step out of their own way, uh, a lot of times, unfortunately, it just seems like they're 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 they have this so much struggle over just accepting it. You don't have to struggle over it. He's offered it to you. All you have to do is believe it. And yes, it is God that brings the belief to you, but there is a a, a portion of it that does depend on you just accepting it. It doesn't make you save the accepting it. I mean, it it does in that you're accepting the free gift. You're not saved by the acceptance of it, that in and of itself. Uh, he's already done the work. It's because of the work he did, Jesus, nothing added. Um, uh, in the same way, you're not saved by the quote-unquote decision. You're saved by what Christ did on the cross, bottom line. And you have to get to the point where you just accept it. Uh, but this is the beautiful part. 
but we're not in bondage again to fear. We don't have to fear. Before we found God, yes, we lived in fear because our, our bodies were dead. We lived in fear. We don't have to fear anymore. He hasn't given us the spirit of fear. So, but but uh, ye have received the spirit of adoption. That's what I mentioned earlier. So we're adopted in into God's family, uh, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, which I translate, uh, we love our dad. <laughs> uh, he's our dad. He, you know, you can, it says father here. Um, I, I call him father, but he, he would be okay with, with us calling him dad. It's a personal word. It's not separate and far away. He wants to be our dad. He wants, uh, if we're adopted, if we're his adopted children, he treats it, treats us in the same way. When he calls us joint heirs with Christ, we're as much his son as Christ is. Uh, and that's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Uh, all right, Brother Steve, I'm gonna read verse 10 through uh, uh, 15 in the Amplified so you get the continuity of these verses and then give me your thoughts and then after that we'll we'll have to start summing up our thoughts because it's at 11 p.m. in the East so um, here goes brother Steve if Christ lives in you though your natural body is dead because of sin your spirit is alive because of righteousness which he provides and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but not to our flesh, our human nature, our worldliness, our sinful capacity, to live according to the impulses of the flesh or nature without the Holy Spirit. For if you are living according to the impulses of the flesh, you are going to die. But if you are living by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are habitually putting to death the sinful deeds of the body, you will really live forever. For all who are allowing themselves to be led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading again to fear of God's oops, judgment, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, the spirit producing sonship, by which we joyfully cry, Abba, Father. I like that joyfully cry, that part. Brother Steve? Brother Steve, can you hear us? Yes, yes, All right. amen. Sorry, You're I forgot up, buddy. to hit the uh, hit the uh, the unmute button. What I see here is very interesting, and in, uh, from Romans one or, or Romans eight one to Romans fifth to Romans eight fifteen, um, it's kind of. I'm, I'm sort of giving my synopsis, but uh, what he's doing here, I think in verse uh, 10, if, if Christ lives in you through your natural body, I'm reading in the Amplified again, um, if Christ lives in you, though your natural body is dead because of sin, we just kind of went over that. Uh, I went over 10 before. Um, and he, I loved how you put those two together from 10 to verse 15. Uh, your spirit is alive because of righteousness, which Christ provides. And then you go to all the way down to, to verse 15, that we haven't received that spirit for fear of God's judgment, but for, uh, but we've received that spirit for uh, the spirit of adoption uh, as the sons, uh, as the sonship of, of God, um, our, 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 uh, our, uh, our, what is what we have aired to in Christ? Um, H e i r, not e r r. H e i r. We are his his heirs, um, and that we receive that from him. 
Uh, but uh, I guess what what I would sum up as what I see him saying all throughout this, uh, but in let me, I'm sorry, I'm a little scatterbrained at the moment. Um, but uh, uh, you mean just at the moment? <laughs> yeah, just at the moment. <laughs> just at the moment. Because um, I, have, I have trouble trying to analyze separate a bunch of verses all at the same time. I do better going through them one by one, but I'll just do that and then give my, uh, tell me when to do my, my sum up. And, um, and, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, who he, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. So in verse 10, we, we have, our spirit is alive because of the righteousness of Christ. In verse 11, he will give life to our mortal bodies. And then uh, in verse 12, uh, and I believe in 13, he talks about how we live uh, in this life either brings death or life to our body here and now. So uh, th there's if we continue on the path of sin and, and live according to the flesh, those things which are contrary to the things of the spirit, we will die. Uh, and probably a lot sooner than we were supposed to. Uh, and if we live according to the spirit and those th things which are actually contrary to the flesh by living according to the spirit, we are habitually putting to death like it said in verse 13 but if you are living by the power of the holy spirit you are habitually putting to death the sinful deeds of the body uh, that that is a true statement that that when you live by the power of the spirit when you walk according to the spirit you are automatically putting to death crucifying the flesh that they're one or the other. If you if you're if you're living for for the flesh, you're not doing for the for the spirit. If you're doing if you're doing for and by the spirit, you're in total uh, total contrariness to to the flesh. Uh, so there there's our our uh, pro progressive salvation. Uh, and in verse ten, you have our eternal salvation given beforehand in the righteousness that he provides in verse 15, you have the, the uh, fulfillment of that down payment that we're given in verse 10, which is the Holy spirit and the, the seal of the Holy spirit, the righteousness, the imputed righteousness of Christ. And then in between there, we have how we live that is the, that middle ground between the first and the last and Christ fulfills it all. Whether we live one way or the other, he will still finish it. Um, and, and so I, I, I guess my final thoughts on it would be second uh, Corinthians one ten uh, that, I see Paul doing it from Romans 8, 1 to Romans 8, 15, where he starts out with in Romans 1, therefore we have no condemnation for those of us that are in Christ. And then he talks about how we're supposed to live as believers. And then in verse 15, this is what we long and hope for. We, we're saved, we're being saved, and we shall be saved, like it says in 2 Corinthians 1.10. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, eternal life, and he will deliver us. Uh, I have it in the wrong version, sorry. <laughs> I like how it reads in the King James uh, better, if I can go there, if it will go there. And I don't have it in the King James. Hold on. One second. One second. I'm sorry. 
my browser is not working. So I'm going to the print version. I'm almost there. It's a race. Okay. I got it. I got it. Who delivered us? This is Christ. Who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. I think that, you know, sums up the three tenses of salvation. We are delivered. We are being delivered and we shall be delivered. That we, we are delivered. We have eternal life right now. We're seated in heavenly places. We, he doth deliver us as we walk through this life. We have those promises like greater is he who is within you than he that is in the world. Uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that if we walk according to the, to the spirit, we mortify the deeds of the body. Uh, they're all saying the same thing, that when we do it God's way and with God, that we're not doing it the way of the flesh. That's the... Uh, be that's the doth deliver. That's the current deliverance. And then in whom we trust shall deliver us is the adoption of our bodies, that glorification of our bodies that we long and wait for, that the whole world groans and waits for that day of being uh, made new. Because it, even the world, the, the actual earth knows that it, is waiting for restoration and renewal to its original purpose and intent, which was to walk for God to walk with us on this earth all day, every day for us to be in complete harmony together with God. Amen. Okay. Amen. Um, all right. Um, Brother Cripps, do you want to say anything more about these verses uh, before you sum up your thoughts? I do not. I'll, I'll go straight to the summing up if you're okay, okay with that. All right, go ahead. Yeah, so the few things I just want to reiterate, uh, uh, great study tonight. Um, I just want to touch on the prayer thing again. Just talk to him. Just talk to him throughout the day. It doesn't. He doesn't need it to be a, some kind of grand thing. Um, also, it is a choice to walk uh, in, in uh, his spirit. Uh, for those of us that are believers, if you're not a believer, you're listening to this, not a believer. Um, all you have to do is turn to him and just ask him, just tell him whatever your situation might be and tell him that you want to know him and he will show you. He, he will uh, uh, keep all his promises. So if there's any part of you that wants to know him, then he's uh, ministering to you. Um, and and uh, just it's just so easy. He loves you. He's knocking at the door of your heart. Um, just, just open it up to him. He'll come into you. Um, the other thing is that we don't have to, we're not uh, slaves to the uh, old law or the flesh. Uh, we're free to walk in the newness of life, as Paul has said many times in the chapters that uh, previously, and he makes that clear here. And then lastly, uh, we are looking forward to that quickening. We are looking forward, as, as Steve put so eloquently. Um, I'm glad you took the time to find it, Steve, because that was a nice little add uh, to the study. Uh, we're waiting for that moment when uh, he quickens uh, our mortal bodies and we're um, alive in, in the newness of life in our spirit. And he wipes away all tears. We never have to struggle with the flesh again never have to worry about anything. And we see him, I like how you put it, Steve, every day. Uh, we, we won't ever have to be separated from him again, ever. And we walk in harmony. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful idea. How many times do we want harmony in our life? And we try to try to find that in this world. And But this is perfect harmony with nothing from the outside, no circumstances coming against us, no uh, spiritual or physical attacks even, um, in perfect health, and just have that last forever, which is hard to wrap our finite minds around. But there is no end to this harmony, this, this beautiful joy that we will be in when we're able to fellowship with him and fellowship with each other. Thanks, guys. 
All right, uh, Steve, you want to sum up your thoughts on the talk? Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, I basically uh, just just did, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, sum it up again. Well, you don't um, need to do it again if you've already done it. That's all right. I don't need yeah. To do uh, the the sum well, up would really be yeah, just the gospel. Start, <laughs> yeah, you did start with verse one through fifteen, so you covered it all again. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, all right. Well, I want to thank uh, Brother Steve and Brother Cripps for uh, joining me tonight. And uh, uh, if if you didn't notice that Sister Renee was not with us, <laughs> you, I'd be surprised. Uh, she's normally here with us every Wednesday and also every Sunday. And she is in the hospital right now. She's having emergency surgery. And uh, please, uh, I know you're praying for her. And, and if you're not aware of it, start praying for her. Keep praying for her to not only this particular problem, but just a, a series of, of problems she's been dealing with. Um, now, uh, to sum up this, uh, this uh, study tonight, um, Paul, uh, I know I've already said it, but uh, Paul, he, everything he says, there's a reason for him saying it. He doesn't just talk just to hear himself talk. He, he's, he's stating something because there's a problem and he wants to address the problem. And uh, the problem is uh, these people, they can't seem to get it through their heads that they're set free from the law, that there is no condemnation. God, and it's the same problem that we deal with every day here. Even those people we love and call brother and sister, and, and it, it, it keeps popping up where they have all this fear, and they don't realize that they are free from condemnation. Paul had to keep on repeating it to people, and we have to keep on repeating it to people, and it's such a sad, sad state because if you, uh, uh, if if you continue to go back to having these feelings of condemnation, then I ask you, did you ever understand the gospel? If you never did understand it right, let's make it clear right now that, that you are not condemned and you are guaranteed eternal life by Jesus and nothing can change that. And uh, until you understand and believe that, you are going to have fears and worries about about these things, and it's the, to me, it's the saddest thing is someone whose name in Jesus is their, is their savior and and doesn't have that peace and joy, and and uh, that should come with it. So uh, that is the, the gospel. The gospel should result in getting rid of your feelings of condemnation, your your worry about am I good enough? Am I am failing? Yeah, you failed. We've all failed. But Jesus succeeded. <laughs> and that's what saves us. Jesus is success, not ours. Um, now, um, so we didn't get through chapter 8 completely. Uh, we're about halfway through it. So maybe next week we'll get through the rest of chapter 8. But I'm particularly excited about chapter 9. I've been doing a lot of preparation for it. I've actually been waiting for five years to do a, a teaching on Romans 9. And so it's it's going to be uh, real important. It's one of the most important chapters in the whole Bible because it is the ground floor foundation of uh, the most evil philosophy in the world, Calvinism. Wow, there we go. Um, so uh, probably not this next Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, I expect that we'll get into begin Romans nine, and uh, there, there's it's going to blow your blow your mind because very few people understand have any idea of what it's really talking about, and and so many people they bring in their preconceived uh, ideas and philosophies and stuff as they're reading it, they're applying that instead of. Instead of studying what is it really talking about, and much of it is Paul quoting Old Testament. Mm. A lot of it is Paul quoting Old Testament. So mm. we're going back into the Old Testament to see 
all those quotes Paul's talking about that people are not getting in context. What really was the, the point? Yes. Um, all right. So, uh, yeah, join us next Wednesday, uh, 9 p.m. Pacific for uh, this uh, Wednesday night Bible study. Join us Sunday uh, for the Church of the Eternally Secure, 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and uh, uh, two days from now, I'll be interviewing uh, Sister Anna. I have an interview scheduled with her. That will be 9 p.m. Eastern time. All right. Uh, so, uh, Brother Steve and, and Brother Cripps, what, what's on your schedule for the rest of the week? Uh, I don't have anything uh, scheduled until Sunday night at 9 for True Story Live. Other than that, um, I'll be listening to whatever other shows are uh, going on, um, uh, talking doctrine and whatnot. Uh, but I'm, I haven't been asked to be a part of uh, anything unless Steve's doing his show on Saturday. So uh, if Steve's doing his show on Saturday, then I'll be a part of that Saturday night. So I'll uh, kick it over uh, Tim for that, but uh, it's been a pleasure. Good night to everyone in the chat room, and I love you guys. That's it. And, uh, yes, I hope to be doing my uh, show on Saturday as well. Um, don't uh, have anything specific planned other than either we're going to do a continuation from the last uh, topic which was two Saturdays ago on the helmet of salvation, uh, unless uh, we have possibly uh, some some guests that would like to come on and share their own personal life stories in relevance to spiritual warfare. Uh, I, I know of a few people that might be willing to do that, and if you are, email me uh, at. Uh, my email i'll put it in the the chat uh, but uh go ahead and do that if if you would like to at some point um uh talk about your own journey and uh spiritual warfare especially the stuff that uh some might not be willing to 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 listen to because it's out of the box or kind of strange or uh, other people have said, oh, no, that's that kind of stuff never happens. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'd like, love to talk uh, through some stuff with uh, different people and look at what they're going through and how we can apply the concepts of spiritual warfare in our, li in our daily lives. And so some real-life examples would be great for that. Um, other than that, I'll be seeing you, uh, Jason, on Sunday night, I'm sure. Uh, hopefully, I'll be back to work tomorrow. Uh, so, yeah. God okay. bless. All right. Thank you. And I, I noticed in the chat room that Sister Anna said uh, 10 p.m. for the interview. No, uh, Anna, uh, 6 p.m. Pacific. That means Central Time. That would be 8 p.m. Friday night is the interview with you. Uh, if that time doesn't work, let me know. But that's the time I do them, 6 p.m. Pacific. 8 p.m. East uh, Central. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for participating. And bless you all in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus.